Hello and welcome to Showcase coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. The King of Atlantis finally makes his debut. Later in the show, we'll talk about why Aquaman could make or break DC Entertainment. We'll also introduce you to a dream team of investigators you might want to have a chat with before purchasing a one-of-a-kind artwork. After that, we'll head to a former industrial zone turned cultural oasis to stroll through a district in Miami decorated with street art. But first... The juxtaposed worlds of Chris Cooksey, a mixed-media artist whose intricate sculptures capture humanity at its best and its worst. Krampot! Krampot! Big stories, small format. Turkey celebrates the short film medium with a new festival. With its compact narrative and minimalist structure, the short film is considered to be at the heart of fictional visual storytelling. Taking that into account, Turkey has created a healthy number of creative platforms for those working within the short film format. And one newly created festival is bringing a different perspective to this incredibly hard to master art form. Showcase's Alijan Pamir shows us how. Istanbul, one of the cinema capitals of the world, has recently added to its resume a new outlet for the makers of short films. Founded by fans of storytelling, some of whom are also filmmakers themselves, the International Amity Short Film Festival wants to highlight the somewhat abstract concept of friendship onto the screen. This is the first time such a concept has been chosen as the main theme of a festival. And the response was huge. 800 features from 80 different countries answered the call. But in addition to the theme of friendship, the films now in competition also deal with issues of family, race and gender. The Amity Festival, clearly on a global mission to bring people together, was inspired by a philosophy belief about championing tolerance through different ways of thinking. We have a, a not so famous but very important person as called uh, Fethi Gemuroğlu. And uh, he has a speech about the amity, about the friendship. So this uh, gave us very, very uh, motivation to start with this uh, idea to make a new film festival, international film festival. And as you know, there is uh, the, fi the, the fight, the war and the conflict in every world now. And the most things that now we need is friendship and amity between the whole world, from people to people, country to country, geography to geography and history to history. So uh, this encourage us to start uh, for the first version of this festival. The organizers of the event believe cinema has the power to make Fethi Gemuhluoğlu's dream happen. The world we live in is divided. Societies are divided over many different arguments. We wanted citizens of this earth to see this, and we wanted to give them something to bond over through film. We want to build a positive future by reminding people the shared values we have. And the jury has the utmost faith in the festival's offerings to help spread the word of love. There are some really good films here, and it's great that there are both national and international works in competition. I can't stress this enough. We need Amity worldwide. The Amity Festival runs between the 14th and the 16th of December. But after it wraps up here in Istanbul, the event will keep building bridges of friendship beyond the borders of Turkey by taking its selection of films on the road to Bosnia. Over the last decade, Chris Cooksey has created sculptures that intimately explore the human psyche. Using a mixture of media, his work is layered with moments that capture human struggle, conflict, faith and tranquility all at the same time, all in an effort to take his viewers on a provocative journey where reality collides with fantasy. 
Is this a sweet dream or a beautiful nightmare? Using both classical art and Baroque architecture as inspiration, Chris Cooksey intricately assembles these multi-layered sculptures that challenge the viewer to seek out a new meaning to the madness before them. The closer you get, the more you see the juxtaposition between beauty and violence within the pieces themselves. I seem to teeter on polarities and things, and so it's all about a storytelling or a narrative that isn't too suggestive, but uh, touches on all these kind of bits of human psychology. I like to think, uh, I like to explore human uh, emotional baggage. Missouri-born Cooksey spends days, weeks, and even months on his creations. His work is inspired by and infused by things like Star Wars and other fantastical stories. With sizes ranging from a few inches to meters, one would think he learned from master craftsmen, but... A lot of this I just learned on my own, um, but I think the painting background really helped me to compose well and as well as finish these pieces, because these are all very disjointed pieces, and the natural color that they come in is very different from everything else. And so to sort of shut off all the color and bring it to you know, a monotone, unified effect uh, is really you know, quite a challenge. Most of his sculptures blossom from a larger central piece, the challenge for him is to painstakingly source, arrange, and secure each piece by hand. Still, he has something even bigger he wants to be remembered by. I have this fantasy of building a small castle that I live in, but also becomes my permanent museum collection after I'm gone. So it's that idea that I want this location made and designed decorated by myself, but lives on after I'm gone. So a lot of the great artists you know, have done this sort of thing. Um, and that's all about just making a marker. Like, what do I leave for humanity? How am I remembered? With his amalgamations managing to intrigue and disturb people at the same time, Cooksey is hoping his work is seen by as wide an audience as possible whether they see it in person or within the pages of his book. While his hallucinatory style of art is aimed at firing up a viewer's imagination, one can only wonder what his own dreams are made of. A lot of times they're very, very vivid, like just snapshots, like very uh, detailed, surreal worlds that you know, I feel as though, well, where in the world does that come from? You know, it's like I don't even have the idea or subconscious interaction in you know, forming the dream. It's just sort of a broadcast image sent to me. So it's, it's very surreal. Um, and it makes you wonder, you know, what is divine inspiration? Where does it come from? Is it solely our own imagination or are ideas broadcast to us? Coming up later on the show, DC Entertainment goes deep. The beast has awakened. The time has come. Aquaman's time has certainly come as the Justice League's Atlantean King makes his solo film debut. We've been involved in cases where uh, people perpetrating fraud, creating fakes, have gone to prison. And, and so the, the consequences are extremely real for those um, people. Watching the detectives, we'll meet a team of people tasked with solving the art world's greatest mysteries. Miami's many murals, a formerly gritty neighborhood, is transformed into an open-air art fair. But before we bring you those stories, here are a few others that made it onto Showcase's radar. We won! Oh, it is not over. We must continue. Oh! Oh, I 
did not know that. Considered a reliable barometer of how the Oscars will unfold, the 24th Critics' Choice Awards nominations are revealed. And the Art House film, The Favourite, received 14 nominations, including Best Picture, Best Actress for Olivia Colman, and Best Supporting Actress for both Rachel Weisz and Emma Stone. Marvel's Black Panther followed close behind The Favourite with 12 nods. The award ceremony will be held on January 13. The Queen song, Bohemian Rhapsody, has become the most streamed song of the 20th century, surpassing 1.6 billion streams globally. The six-minute track, sung by Queen's lead singer, Freddie Mercury, was told it would never sell or go mainstream. The song's popularity was especially boosted this year, thanks to the movie of the same name, which is being considered a serious contender for an Oscar. Buying a piece of art can be a high-stakes gamble, as sales increase, prices increase, and inevitably so do the number of forgeries. But how do you know that the piece you've set your heart on is genuine? Enter the art detectives. With backgrounds in science, technology, and history, they're able to tell a da Vinci from a dud. Showcases Miranda Addy went to visit one of London's best teams to find out if they can spot a fraud. There's data to analyse, colour fragments to check, and imaging of different layers of paint to scan. All these tools are part of an average day at Art Analytics and Research. Founded in 2009, it's one of a handful of companies in London that investigate the origin of a piece of art, its value and its authenticity. I'm spending a few hours with the London office's principal investigator, Jeline Nadolny. Jeline, a huge part of what you do here is analysing paintings like this and telling the owners about the provenance. Now, you've brought two examples to show us here. Can you tell us a little bit about the specifics of each piece of work? Alfred Wallace painted seascapes, uh, towns and, and boats and things he would have seen, and he used remnants of boat paint. A lot of the fakes we find of his are made in normal artist materials. He's very easy to fake because he was a self-taught artist, he's not highly blended, not highly sophisticated, um, and forgers think, oh, I can do this. And the other one that we have here um, was bought by another client, uh, this time at an auction house uh, in Europe um, as the work of a, um, an important British modernist, Morgan Russell. The forger's really taken a lot of effort to make it look old. They've rubbed dirt into the surface to make it age and get this sort of brownish effect. Um, it's again made of materials that the artist wouldn't have access to. Being a detective in the art world is big business. Worldwide art sales hit $63.7 billion in 2017, according to Art Basel's Global Art Report. That was a 12% increase over the previous year. Selling a fake has huge repercussions for auction houses and private collectors alike. If you're out there forging paintings, you're committing crimes. Uh, and so we've, we've been involved in cases where uh, people perpetrating fraud creating fakes have gone to prison and, and so the, the consequences are extremely real for those um, people. On the other side of it, uh, you know, we have people come to us who believe they've discovered a, lot, a lost masterpiece and if we're able to help them, it's not just, you know, finding something of value, it's being able to help them understand what it is they have and the story of this object, uh, you know, previously lost to, to culture and, and art history. The team is comprised of historians, physicists, art experts and forensic scientists. And it's this combination of specialities and perspectives that makes the company so unique. While the scientists and technicians analyse the data, historians and art experts take into account wider context. So we've got lots and lots of art books and um, all our art chemistry books and our pigment books like the Pigment Compendium which um, our founder worked on with a group of specialist colleagues which allows us to have really an unparalleled knowledge of pigments. They analyse tiny samples from paintings via microscopes and high-tech scanners. 
Here we have a portrait by Rembrandt that was auctioned by Christie's here in London. And um, what we did was do a series of technical imaging to look at how the painting was put together and in this case, what it was painted over. The technical imaging we're using uses rays that go through the surface, bounce off the ground of the painting and show what's in between the ground of the support and uh, what you see with the naked eye. So here we're starting to get some forms coming out. We know something's going on there. And if we look at it with x-ray, we can actually see there's a portrait of an old man here. Art investigation is becoming an increasingly vital part of the industry. That's because failing to take a piece's origin or attribution seriously could have a huge impact on our understanding of both an artist's technique and their development. Not to mention the financial ramifications. With a guaranteed refund for fake works, it's no wonder Sotheby's recently launched its own investigation unit in New York and plans to expand to London. The stakes may be increasingly high, but the art detectives have got it covered. Miranda Atty, TRT World, London. Graphic novel aficionados and film fandoms agree that DC Entertainment falls far behind rival Marvel Publishing when it comes to movie adaptations. And after a recent string of failures like Batman vs Superman and the Justice League, DC could be jumping the shark by bringing out its final trump card, Aquaman. But will this underwater adventure tale be enough to keep this 84-year-old company afloat? Let's just say you do your best thinking when you're not thinking at all. All right, now hold still. Hey, what are you doing? We need water. Based on fan favorite writer Jeff John's acclaimed storyline from the comic books, this latest version of Aquaman finds a king of Atlantis fighting those who want to ravage his kingdom. This time around to make sure the movie breaks the spell of previous critical failures, Warner Brothers Studios called up director James Wan. Wan is currently the company's resident wonder kid who keeps cranking out critical hits like the Conjuring series. Wan says his film will be anything but conventional superhero movie fare. I actually think uh, that is the thing that makes him really interesting. You know, the, the approach to him is not traditional, and, uh, and I do feel like there, there, there is a lot of superhero movies out there, and to have a different approach help make us stand out from the crowd. The war is coming to the surface. You are not going to win this. In the past, Aquaman himself received some unintended laughs from comic readers due to their bad design and makers of Aquaman the movie worked hard to avoid getting the wrong kind of laughs from movie audiences. You know, it was the idea to put the tattoos on and stuff and we found ourselves going, how do you dress Aquaman? I mean, you're not gonna put him in a polo or come on, I mean, he, he's got a pretty distinctive look and so he wanted a bit of a rock and roll rebel kind of vibe and he, since he traveled all around the world through the ocean, he picked up little things here and there. That he, the people he'd work with. So that's, I think that's how we kind of built it. I'm no leader. I'm not a king. Expectations for Aquaman are high, and those involved with the production are well aware of this fact, because it's likely that the failure of the movie will bring DC Entertainment's current film continuity to a dramatic end. But what could be greater than a king? A hero. So did DC Entertainment make it back up to the top of the superhero ladder with Aquaman? Let's find out from the managing director of Cinema Blend, Sean O'Connell. Sean, it's really good to see you again here on Showcase. It all comes down to whether Aquaman is the ultimate hit for DC Entertainment, is it? It is, or at least it's going to be. So far, it's performing extremely well in China. It's going to open up to the rest of the world very soon. Um, it is definitely a great film in the DC canon, and DC kind of needed a, a big one to come along because they've had a real roller coaster ride um, with movies that perform really well, like Wonder Woman, uh, and then equally they have some lows with movies that miss the mark, like Justice League. What I think DC is starting to figure out is if they don't rush these team up movies the way that Marvel does. Uh, you know, they want what Marvel Studios has, and they can't really take the time to build the foundation. They need to just focus on these individual characters, let them shine in their own movies. Um, Aquaman is just a standalone Aquaman movie. It's not connected to the bigger world. It doesn't have to be. And it allows Jason Momoa and his director, James Wan, to just tell an excellent, um, compelling, and epic Aquaman movie. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Now, um, we've seen all sorts of superheroes that have all sorts of superhero powers, but we don't really know much about Aquaman. Tell me a bit about his characteristics. Well, if I say them out loud, they sound really silly. Like it's just, he can breathe underwater, he can communicate with fish, um, but it's the underwater part that sets him apart from everybody else because there's this entire kingdom of Atlantis, this mysterious kingdom that was above the surface many, many years ago. Um, due to mistakes they made themselves, their, their kingdom is now at the bottom of the ocean, but they've all adapted over the years to be able to survive down there. So it, it sets up, um, a colleague of mine described it as almost Star Wars, but under the water, and I think that's a fairly accurate comparison. There's also a Game of Thrones element to it, and, and believe it or not, I can't believe I'm saying this with an Aquaman movie, there's a Shakespeare element to it. There's, you know, uh, warring families that are that are grasping for control of the throne. Uh, Arthur Curry, who is the Aquaman, is sort of thrown into it because of his royal heritage. It really taps into all of those beats, and it, and it does it really well. Now, I want to take a moment to talk about Jason Momoa for a second here, because he has been praised for being able to really incorporate incorporate his own personality into this character, hasn't he? He really has. And that's the funny part about this is that Momoa's interpretation of Aquaman, to me, has always been a little bit off because it's not what I expect in the comic books. In the comic books, Aquaman is uh, blonde, short-haired, um, from, from a royal family. He's, he's uh, supposed to be sitting on the throne of Atlantis, so he sort of treats himself that way. Momoa from the get-go, and I think it's because of the influence of his original director, Zack Snyder, who directed Batman vs. Superman and half of Justice League, they created him into a bit of a fraternity boy. You know, he was a bit of a bro. He had uh, catchphrases like, my man, and things like this. And you were always kind of like, well, who is this? This isn't really Aquaman. But this movie takes that aspect of him. He has some of that in the beginning. But it shows how he evolves away from this anti-hero of someone who has powers but doesn't really want to help people to finally accepting the fact that he's on this path to the throne of Atlantis. It's his destiny. He has to rise to it. And I think the movie does a really great job of letting Momoa sort of go on that character arc. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I want to take a moment to talk about the movie in general. Most of it, if not all of it, takes place underwater. But if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. only in one scene, they actually use water. Um, tell me about the special <laughs> effects that they've used and the, the amazing job that James Wan pulled off with this movie. It's truly incredible, and I think that that's where James Wan needs to get the most credit because somewhere along the way, he figured out technically how to make an Aquaman movie without having to put your characters in water. So I'm assuming, Sean, that you think that there is for sure going to be a franchise of Aquaman at this stage. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. If I'm Warner Brothers, I'm on the telephone with both Jason Momoa and James Wan right now to set up a sequel. And this is something that we saw with Wonder Woman um, after it connected and became a huge hit. They brought Gal Gadot and they brought Patty Jenkins, her director, right back to do another story. I assume that's what's going to happen with this one. Um, we know the next five DC movies, they don't include Aquaman just yet, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that because this movie is A, critically received, but also doing really well at the box office in a very crowded theatrical frame, that yeah, I think DC is going to have this on the, on the calendar very soon. Sean O'Connell, thank you so much for joining us once again here on Showcase and sharing that information with us. Always a pleasure. We've come to the end of another edition of Showcase, but before we sign off, here's a story about art helping a neighborhood come alive. Ten years ago, Miami's Wynwood neighborhood wasn't a safe place to walk at night, but one resident decided to do something about it, and now it's not only safe, but a haven for artists and art lovers. Visit our YouTube channel for more of Showcase's stories about the international art scene. I'm Efnan Han, thanks for watching and see you next time.